Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Yeadon and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. For those of you who do not know who Impetus Digital is, we're a company that has built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. And we work with life science co uh, companies across the globe to help them do things like advisory boards, virtual working groups, medical education, uh, with payers, patients, allied healthcare providers, physicians. And since COVID-19, we've been helping a lot of our clients virtualize their in-person POA brand rollouts, MSL, sales rep training, et cetera. But what's most important here is that at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a thought, a big, hairy, audacious idea that we can then generate, have dialogues like the ones that we're having with provocateurs like the Aubreys of the world, other leading edge and bleeding edge thinkers to do something that we can all collectively do to positively disrupt healthcare. It's the onus, it's the modus operandi behind Impetus, why we're doing these YouTube channels and podcasts and why we have built the Impetus Insight platform. So we can continue these dialogues so that we can all do something really courageous. So I'm so pleased to have um, Aubrey de Grey today in our session. I'm so excited. I feel like I've known him for a long time. I'm a biohacker. And for those of you who also have been following Aubrey, he's done a ton of work in some really interesting space around anti-aging. Aubrey has a PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he has focused his work on the development of medical innovations that can help to postpone all forms of age-related ill health. Um, his main focus is really on rejuvenation. So it's actually a very positive spin on aging. So he's really looking at the active repair of a variety of molecular and cellular damage that eventually causes age-related disease and disability. So it's a really different way of looking at the inevitability of aging. And he's the chief science officer at SENS Research Foundation. It's a California-based charity that undertakes and funds research in this field. So he's also the editor-in-chief of Rejuvenation Research, and he is the highest impact peer-reviewed academic journal that is focused on postponing aging. He's also the author of the highly rated Ending Aging, um, including um, TEDx Talks. So welcome, Aubrey. So happy to have you here. Well, thank you for having me on the show. It's awesome. So um, why don't we actually just sort of start from the beginning of really, uh, you know, giving us a little bit of a background. Uh, you obviously have a PhD, had an interest in science. Tell us a little bit about the trajectory that got you through your professional journey and interested in rege regenerative medicine. Yes, though so it's quite an unusual journey, actually. I did not even start out as a biologist. I originally started as a computer scientist. And that was because when I was a teenager, I started programming, found out I was good at it, and I wanted to work on problems for humanity, uh, of which I felt one big problem was the problem of work. The fact that people have to spend so much of their time doing stuff that they would not do unless they were being paid for it. Um, so I thought, well, okay, um, we need more automation. That's what artificial intelligence is designed to be for. So I will work in artificial intelligence research. And I did that. I did my first degree, my undergrad degree in computer science, also at Cambridge. And I worked for several years in AI research. Uh, but during that time, I met and married a biologist, uh, someone who was a lot older than me, actually. She was, she was already a full professor in uh, California at UC San Diego, and she was in the UK where I was then on sabbatical. Uh, and uh, through her, I first of all learned a whole bunch of biology, of course, but um, also, I gradually began to realize that I had been the victim of a really tragic misconception all my life. Namely, I had assumed that biologists were working on aging. Because it had always been obvious to me that aging was the number one problem for humanity, even bigger than the problem of work. And yet, um, you know, we didn't hear any progress, but I presumed that everyone else thought the same way, and therefore, you know, people would be trying their best. 
and you had discovered then that my ex-wife now um, and all the other biologists I was meeting, in fact, um, thought that aging was actually not very interesting and not very important. And it took me a couple more years to really come to terms with that, but eventually I decided, well, I've got no choice, really. I've got to switch fields. And I understood at that point that actually people who switch fields tend to do quite well in their new field because they're, you know, unencumbered by the conventional wisdom of the field and so on. And I was in a nice position, so I could basically do, so I had a lot of spare time that I was able to just repurpose and build a whole new career for myself. So that's how I got here. That is fantastic. I love the fact that you have a computer background and then obviously some of the ways and the thinking that you've applied to this concept of aging. So we really need to dig into this because I think as you've alluded to, Aubrey, is that we have always looked at aging as being this inevitability, that it was just one of those things that <clears throat> one couldn't fix. It was just something that was going to happen to us. So maybe what we can actually spend a few minutes doing is redefining what aging actually is. So how have you actually taken this very holistic concept and broken it down into something that we've never really considered before? Yeah, in fact, I would actually go a little further. I would say it's not really a matter of redefining aging. It's a matter of defining it at all. I think the only reason that people are able to adopt such ridiculously irrational points of view about aging is because they don't have a definition of aging to start with, not, not a coherent one. And different people have different incoherent definitions in their heads. So, for example, um, yes, you're quite right. People think of aging as this thing that's kind of woven into the fabric of the universe in such a way that it's kind of off limits to medicine. Um, but they don't think of the so-called diseases of, of aging that way. They don't think of Alzheimer's that way or cancer or atherosclerosis and so on. And so we have to ask ourselves, is there actually any real biological basis for that distinction? And the answer is no, there isn't. There's absolutely none. The difference between the so-called diseases of aging and aging itself is purely semantic. There are some aspects of aging that we have chosen to give disease-like name to and others that we haven't. And I believe that the only reason we cling to this completely unjustified um, Chinese war between these two things is because the diseases of aging, as we call them, the more kind of tangible aspects of aging that we can start kind of, you know, say that there's some kind of binary thing. We can say either someone has them or they don't. Um, you know, those aspects somehow it's, it's impossible to say, oh, these are inevitable and they're woven into the universe because some people get them and some people don't. Um, whereas people like to think of the things called aging itself as more universal. But really all it is is that they happen at a, a less variable age. You know, they, you know everyone, everyone actually will get cancer however, if they live long enough without getting anything else. And the same goes for Alzheimer's. The same goes... So, you know, that's part of it. And it's psychological because people somehow they need to make their peace with aging in order to get on with their, their miserably short lives and you know, make the best of it without being preoccupied by this terrible thing. And by kind of carving off bits of aging and calling them diseases um, and, you know, putting them up as the thing that, that, that people hate and they do want to cure. They, it kind of makes it easier to make that peace with the rest of it. Yeah, it's actually a very profound concept. And, and quite frankly, there's so many different ways of hitting it, uh, not only at a biological, but also at a physical level, but also a, like a, a, almost a metaphysical level. There, there's so many different ways to look at this because it's so ingrained as part of the human psyche and the experience and there's actually so much spirituality associated with aging, dying, and, you know, and the afterlife, et cetera. So there's a lot there. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about your, um, very, your infamous book, Ending Aging. Um, and so we have really pronounced this idea of um, uh, being able to use technologies to basically reverse the physiological decay, if you will, of the body of, you know, of, of, of our, our essence of our, you know, our biology. So tell us a little bit about what you believe in essence is, is the ability to do this. Um, sure. 
and you know what what are we doing and can we actually live forever so yeah i mean first of all let's be clear it's not just what i believe this is now very established and orthodox and mainstream as a way of thinking about aging um it starts from the uh, you know reminding ourselves that the body is a machine it's obviously a really really complicated machine but it's still a machine and that means that its function is determined ultimately by its internal structure. Um, so the thing is that any machine, or at least any machine with moving parts, um, undergoes damage. It, it damages itself as a side effect of its normal operation. If we look at, for example, cars, you know, they accumulate rust and, you know, contaminants in the oil and so on. But we see today that there are cars that are 100 years old driving around. Uh, I mean, of course, not very many, but if you go back down to, let's say, 50 years, you know, most cars in Cuba are more than 50 years old, so I'm told. Um, you know, how come? I mean, they were not designed to last that long. This is the key point. So the answer to that question is very simple. Preventative maintenance. It works. If you don't wait until the doors fall off because there's so much rust, but rather you regularly remove the rust every so often um, so that it never gets to the point where the doors fall off, then you can carry on doing it as long as you like. The doors will never fall off. And of course, the same applies to the rest of the car. So we know from our experience with simple man-made machines that preventative maintenance works. And all I have done, um, and yes, I was the first person to do it, and for a long time I was kind of a uh, voice in the wilderness, um, but 20 years ago, I started putting forward the idea that maybe we could do the same thing. We could do comprehensive preventative maintenance on the human body. We could simply look at all of the types of damage that the body does to itself throughout life that eventually contribute to the health problems of late life, and we could repair them. We wouldn't need to repair them perfectly either. We would just need to repair them every so often well enough that the overall total, the overall amount of damage that the body was carrying around would be subclinical. It would be below the threshold that causes stuff to go wrong. And I was able to um, make a case for this basically by characterizing all of that damage. Because of course you've got to do that, right? You can't repair all the damage unless you know what it is. Um, so basically what I did was I classified it into a small number of categories, there's seven categories. And this was what you needed because for each category one could define a generic repair strategy. So for example, one category was loss of cells, where cells are dying. Normally what you want is for cells to, that die to be replaced by the division of another cell. But sometimes that doesn't happen and so that means that the number of cells in the affected tissue will gradually go down and down and eventually there won't be enough for the tissue to do its job and that's a problem. So for example, Parkinson's disease is caused by that kind of thing where you have a particular type of neuron in a particular part of the brain that uh, dies off. Um, and so yeah, the fix is, uh, we all know it, it's stem cell therapy. We prepare cells in the laboratory into the right state so that we can inject them and they know what to do to divide and transform themselves into replacements for the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. And what I did was I went through all of the types of damage that we knew about as gerontologists, people who studied the biology of aging. And I said, well, okay, here is the generic fix for this. Here is the generic fix for that. And of course, a lot, all of these other fixes were a good deal further off at that point, 20 years ago, than stem cell therapy. And they still are, they're still at earlier stages, but they've all progressed a lot. So that as time's gone on, it has become more and more unarguable that this is a realistic way to go. The other thing that makes it realistic is that even when I began in the year 2000, putting this forward, it was already nearly 20 years since anyone had discovered a new type of damage that did not, that, that required me to have seven categories in the first place. So what, you know, one could say, well, okay, that means the whole thing is standing the test of time. We um, are fairly unlikely to come up with an eighth category any time. Um, and indeed, that has continued to be true um, for the subsequent 20 years. We still have only these seven categories, and it's really standing the test of time. So this is all, all pretty good news. So we're going to be talking about, instead of the seven wonders of the world, we're going to linger a little bit on the seven, you know, seven types of damage, if you will, cellular damage or biological damage that results in aging. So 
I'm going to want to linger on these so that the audience here gets an understanding of how you've encapsulated this thinking so that you can systematically review the body like a physical machine, um, which I think actually alludes really nicely to your background on computer programming, okay. um, which we can eventually talk about is eventually the, uh, the uh, you know, humans being the cyborgs and merging with, <laughs> uh, you know, Neuralink, et cetera. But, you know, are we just a big giant machine, but just made out of neural, you know, other types of biological networks? So let's actually talk about the first type of damage. And the first one that you actually have touted is intracellular waste. Can you describe what that is? What kinds of conditions come from that type of damage? Sure, yes. So, um, well, of course, I've already mentioned the first one already, which was loss of cells, but this, this is the next one. Um, yeah, so many, many metabolic processes, things that the body does to keep us alive or the cell does to keep us alive from one day to the next, uh, create byproducts. Um, that are not functional in themselves, but they just happen as a, um, you know, as a consequence of the thing that the process needs to do. And those byproducts, therefore, something needs to happen to them. They need to be destroyed or they need to be excreted. And for all byproducts that are created at a relatively rapid rate, one of those two things does actually happen um, because we have evolved ways you know, to, to make that happen. But the thing is, if something, some byproduct is created at a really, really slow rate, then evolution doesn't bother to do that. It doesn't bother to figure out ways either to break them down or to excrete them, simply because there's a third option, which is simply to sequester them in a kind of garbage can in the cell. And that's okay until old age. And that's okay as far as evolution is concerned because evolution doesn't care about individuals, it only cares about passing on genetic information. And of course, by old age, you've done that. You've had your kids and everything, right? So evolution doesn't care about old people at all. All right, so um, what happens in old age? Well, actually quite a lot of things. So atherosclerosis is, of course, the number one killer in the Western world. It is mainly caused by this exact problem. There's one type of garbage, a type of derivative of cholesterol, Cholesterol itself, incidentally, is a very important molecule. We definitely need our cholesterol, but uh, there is a spontaneously occurring derivative of cholesterol that accumulates because we don't have a way to break it down or to excrete it. And eventually it causes the cells in question, which are a type of white blood cell, to get sick and to become the first step in the formation and growth of an atherosclerotic plug. Another example would be macular degeneration, which is the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. In that case, it's a completely different type of garbage. It's a derivative of vitamin A in this case. And again, it's generated very slowly as a side effect of the chemistry of vision. And uh, it accumulates and eventually there's so much of it that the cell in question in the back of the eye, what are called the retinal pigmented epithelial cells, they get sick. And that's why we get macular degeneration. So what are we doing about that? Well, this is one of the areas where I had an innovative idea that um, was very new and people hadn't discussed it in terms of the biology of aging. I actually stole it from a completely non-medical area, the area of environmental decontamination. So in that area, people use bacteria to get rid of pollutants. They find bacteria that are able to break down pollutants. And I said, well, hang on, we might be able to do this in the human body as well, not with the actual bacteria, but with the genes that the bacteria have that give them the ability to break down the pollutants. So in this case, what we would do is we'd look for a bacterial strain that can break down oxidized cholesterol or whatever, and we will um, get the genes that they do it with and stick them into human cells, and then suddenly the human cells will have the ability that they didn't naturally have have to break down this garbage so it won't accumulate and inde indeed anything that has already accumulated will go away and bang we won't get atherosclerosis so this is something that we started pursuing maybe 15 years ago now and it's you know, very early stage back then so it took a while to get anywhere but it gradually progressed and now both of the um, targets I just mentioned for atherosclerosis and for macular degeneration have are, are pretty close to the clinic actually um there's lots of work been done in not not just in petri dishes but in mice and both of those areas have actually now been spun out as startup companies um that are pursuing it with of course a good deal more funding than what we were able to provide 
uh, because there are now investors in this space and we should talk about that as well. Fantastic. That is a really great summary of that and want to dig a little into that research as well. Um, maybe we, we've talked a little bit about intracellular and intercellular waste and that how that compiles and builds up over time and creates these conditions that you know spin us off into what we oftentimes call an aged body. So another area, the third area that, that you talk about is the nucleus mutations. So can you talk a little bit about what this looks like at a genetic level? Is this something that we're doomed to have just based on our genetics? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, when you say based on our genetics, let's be more fundamental than that. It's based on the fact that our whole body is encoded by DNA. DNA is an extraordinarily powerful way of storing information. Uh, but because it is a storage of information, just like the information in a computer memory, it has the um, potential to be gradually corrupted. And that indeed happens. Uh, you know, it, it's sitting in the cell, you know, metabolism is happening, bad things can happen, toxins can come along, cosmic rays, you know, free radicals, damage happens. Now, that means that the DNA in a typical cell in our body has accumulated a whole bunch of damage. And um, there are things that it can't do, that it used to be able to do, or things that it's doing compulsively that it should only be doing on demand. Um, yeah, but, so this is um, you know, like how, the, how things are in the cell. And we can't stop mutations in the DNA from happening. What we have to do, therefore, is stop them from mattering. And we are, in one sense, actually, we benefit from something that we would not normally think is a good thing, namely cancer. Cancer is something that can be very bad for us if even one cell gets the wrong constellation of mutation, because that can cause it to divide and divide and divide. Um, of course, we know all that. Now, the reason why that's a good thing is because it has been a driving force for evolution. It has compelled evolution to develop really, 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 really good repair and maintenance strategies to prevent mutations from occurring. And those strategies are not perfect, otherwise we just wouldn't get cancer ever. But they are really good. So good, in fact, that we only get cancer by and large late in life. And in particular, what this does is it means that other mutations that do not have to do with uncontrolled cell division are basically protected against unnecessarily well. So that if we had, by some kind of therapy, a complete elimination of cancer, then at least this is my belief, we would not have to worry about any of the other DNA damage that happens in our cells, simply because it would not rise to a level that's actually bad for us for a long, long, long time, many times the current normal lifetime. So in terms of nuclear mutations, our focus at Sense and the focus of my work is specifically against cancer. It's really interesting because there's a lot of other discussions and research and work being discussed around telomeres and yep. telomere length. There's even diagnostics out there. I think one's called teleyears and there's several others where you can actually measure the length of your telomeres to see how what your biological versus you know actual years in life are. You, can you tell us a little bit about how this fits into some of the work that you're thinking? Is this something that you ascribe to around the telomere length? Sure. Okay. And again, this is not something where I'm in any way out on a limb. This is perfectly you know, standard um, you know, um, uh, consensus in this field. The telomeres, for anyone who doesn't know, they are the ends of our chromosomes. And way back 50 years ago, people started to realize that when a cell divides and the chromosomes, the DNA is replicated, there's going to be a problem at the end. Basically, the DNA repair machinery, because of the way it works, will not be able to complete the job at the ends of the chromosomes, and the ends will get a little bit shorter. Um, just a little bit, but still, you know, every time the cell divides, that's going to happen, and it's going to add up. Now, it was immediately recognized that there must be some countervailing process that goes on that, counter, that counteracts this, because if there were not, we wouldn't, hit, we wouldn't be here. Um, of course, in a normal lifetime, the cells in your body only divide a finite number of times, and maybe you know, we can just get away with that. 
but the cells that go into our offspring also have to divide before they divide before they form the cells that make the ne next generation and the one after that so uh, something would have to give right um, so indeed it turned out and this was established firmly only a decade or two later that there is an enzyme called telomerase, which adds DNA to the ends of the chromosomes to compensate for the DNA that's lost when the chromosome is replicated. Now, the relationship to aging comes because cells, of course, in the body, some cells, even if we forget about the cells that go to form our sperm and our eggs, some cells have to divide reasonably often, namely the stem cells or a few rapidly renewing tissues like the blood or the skin. Or the, in, or the lining of the gut, for example. Um, and so, um, you know, we've generally felt that um, maybe there has to be some telomerase expressed there, and indeed that was discovered eventually. People found that there was very, very small amounts of this enzyme being, being made. And it was also felt that in terms of aging, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe the amount of telomere extension that's being done by telomerase is inadequate, and therefore telomeres will get, you know, problematically short. Um, by old age and you know certain genes will not work anymore and so on and sure enough it turns out that there may be cases of this the immune system especially may be prone to this so that leads to the presumption that we might benefit by somehow developing drugs that stimulate more telomerase to be made so that we end up getting um, you know longer telomeres and a longer a, a greater ability for the cells that need to divide a lot to continue to do so later in life. And people have been looking for that with some success. However, oh, there's a, there's another, yeah, but there's a big problem, which is that we have other cells which divide a lot, which I've already talked about, and um, which that where the, their division is not good for us, it's bad for us, namely cancer. And sure enough, what, almost, what most cancers do is they mutate, I have a lot of mutations as I mentioned, one of those mutations is a mutation that turns on the gene that encodes this enzyme telomerase. So and it turns it on really high, so that cancers can divide a lot um, without having this problem that I spoke about. So in that sense we want to suppress telomerase in cancer cells while stimulating it elsewhere and various people have been looking for ways to get the best of both worlds there, to square that circle. Um, we have various ways in which we might be able to do it. Um, there are various ways being developed. There's one particularly exciting one that came out of a university in Dallas um, that's now on its way to clinical trials actually probably this year in Australia, um, where basically cells that are making too much telomerase, kill them, uh, you, can, you can get them to kill themselves by just giving them this drug. Um, and that would kind of be a, be a way to square that circle. Um, but there are other ideas that are also being pursued. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. And there's a lot of work going on in that space. So again, some people consider it controversial or not, but it's interesting to see that people are delving in and exploring some of these things that, you know, you just don't know what, uh, again, if you can create novel um, either chemicals or other sorts of things that can help to augment this, we, you know, again, we could look at this as the biological systems repair and maintenance program. Uh, another thing that people are talking a lot around, especially around energy management, is the powerhouse behind the cells, which is the mitochondria. And the fact that these little organelles, which are really the energy propellers, if you will, are getting depleted over time, and hence one of the key reasons why we are aging. So can you talk a little bit about those mutations or the reasons why they get worn out is there environmental factors that are associated with this, the way we eat? How does, how does mitochondria get depleted in our systems? Absolutely. So, and this is an area that is really quite poorly, you know, quite, quite widely misunderstood, especially by the general public. So the uh, mitochondria are, as you say, the kind of powerhouse of the cell. They perform the chemistry of breathing, which is to say that they take, uh, that they, they, they combine nutrients chemically with oxygen in order to extract energy from those nutrients that is then used by everything the cell does. And that's why we breathe oxygen and we breathe carbon dioxide out. That's all because of the chemistry that mitochondria perform. Now, mitochondria do go downhill during aging. They perform, they do less, they're less functional in late life. 
But there are two reasons why they are less functional, and they are very different reasons. So I need to distinguish these rather carefully for everybody. One reason is that they just get dialed down. There's a regulat regulated process whereby they just work less hard late in life. And the other process is one that happens as a result of the fact that they have their own DNA. They're the only part of the cell that does have its own DNA, outside of the chromosomes I was talking about earlier in the nucleus of the cell. And that's a really bad place for DNA to be because the, um, the chemistry of breathing is hairy. It's actually the main source of these things called free radicals, which are highly toxic molecules that can damage DNA, among other things. So it turns out that the DNA in mitochondria gets damaged far, far faster than the DNA in the nucleus. And that's bad. It turns out that that DNA is not protected by this um, uh, evolutionary mechanism that I mentioned earlier, where you know cancer is the number one problem and therefore everything else gets protected unnecessarily well. You don't get cancer from mitochondrial mutations, which means that evolution has tried much less hard to stop those mutations from happening and accumulating. And sure enough, this means that they do, at least we believe, contribute to the decline in mitochondrial function late in life. And what we're doing at Sense is we're developing a method to stop that from happening, not to stop the mutations themselves from happening, because just as in the nucleus, that is impossible. What we're doing instead is making the mutations harmless by putting backup copies of that mitochondrial DNA into the nuclear DNA, into the chromosome. The DNA needs to be modified in various ways so that it still works, even though it's now in the wrong place, so to speak. Um, but we think we know how to do that. Certainly those modifications are already done. Um, uh, and there's not very much DNA that we need to move. There's only 13 proteins that are encoded in the mitochondrial DNA. So this is a doable job. It's very hard, but it's not impossible. Um, but the other type of mitochondrial decline is, as I say, it's get, things just get dialed down. And this is a very important example of something that people often overlook. A lot of the changes that we see in an older body are not bad for us. They're good for us because they are adaptive. In other words, they are responses that the body is making to minimize the pathological impact of other changes that are happening that really are bad for us. And we can kind of tell the difference between these two, these two. If something is happening in a coordinated way as a result of the change in gene expression in cells, which genes are being turned on and which genes are not being turned on, then we can pretty much guarantee that it's an adaptation of this sort and that we should not be trying to reverse it directly. Because if we do, we will be essentially dismantling the defenses that the body has to minimize the impact of other stuff, like, for example, waste products that I was talking about earlier. We should, only, we should be very, very cautious if we try to manipulate gene expression directly. Wow. Yeah. So um, lot, I know lots of work is going on in, a, in you know, even just very general ways that people are managing energy, Everybody is actually writing a book on mitochondria, regardless if it's well researched or not. But it, it certainly is a uh, a current discussion and a current concept that a lot of people are are speaking about. You mentioned earlier around stem cells, and I know there's a lot of research on therapies with this. We hear a lot about stem cell stem cells as it relates to cancer. Um, tell us a little bit around. Um, the work that's being done and how this can actually really bolster the rejuvenation piece of this so that we can delay, if not indefinitely, the aging or the death of the body. Well, I mean, as I've kind of already indicated, I don't really think it's helpful. In fact, it's actually damaging to view cancer as somehow separate from aging or to view any so-called disease of old age as separate from aging. Cancer is part of aging. It's caused by the accumulation of damage, specifically damage in our chromosomes. Um, so yes, there's a lot going on. So we've talked already about the ways in which we might manipulate telomere shortening and telomere elongation so as to be anti-cancer, and that's definitely helpful. Um, but there's lots of other stuff going on. In particular, one area that has really taken off over the past five or ten years is cancer immunotherapy. This is an area which people had tried to do something with, get the immune system to attack cancers better than it normally does. They've been trying to do that for decades and made almost no success. 
Um, and then suddenly people made a couple of breakthroughs. Some of them have already got Nobel Prizes for it. And, you know, we're off to the races pretty much. There's still a lot of work to do, no question, but we're definitely getting there. And other, uh, you know, we regard it, and other people in the field now regard it as very much part of aging. So, for example, some of the most, some of the leading players in this are people that we talk to all the time, and I help them to get investments, and they help us and so on. Right. Yes, excellent. Um, I actually read a book recently with uh, doc Dr. David Sinclair on uh, um, lifespan, and he talked a lot about sirtuins, he talked a lot about senescent cells, and a huge area of research that's going on with that, um, with yeast and, and other sorts of things. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what SENS is doing there, what, your, what the research is showing around senescent cells. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, David wrote, this, I'm really happy that he was able to write this book. And I was especially happy about the nice bold title that he gave it. I think the subtitle was something like, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. Um, now, this is more or less exactly what I was saying, you know, 12 years before him when I wrote my book. Um, but the difference is that he has a faculty position at Harvard, which means that he has a lot to lose by saying things that could be characterized as irresponsible. Even, um, even if that characterization is unfair. Um, so the fact that someone like him can now write a book with that kind of title is a really strong measure of how far we have come in the debate over the feasibility, the plausibility of bringing aging under medical control. Now, David's work and mine are somewhat complementary to each other. Um, you know, we work very strongly on damage repair whereas a lot of his work is on trying to manipulate the cell so that it makes less damage in the first place. In a sense, we can say that damage repair is kind of the holy grail and, um, you know, slowing down the creation of damage is a bridge to that. You know, it's a way of uh, giving ourselves a longer, longer runway before we need to repair the damage. Um, so that's why I say the two, the two approaches are somewhat complementary. But they're both predicated on the, on the shared understanding that aging is simply the accumulation of damage. And so David, yeah, David, you're quite right, he's very interested in sirtuins. He started out working in yeast, as you say, and he discovered certain genes and their manipulability by certain drugs, especially resveratrol was really where he made his name by, um, because it's, it's a component of red wine. Um, he, uh, of course, has moved on a lot since then and done lots of work, not only in yeast and other organisms, but also in mice. And, um, and um, a bunch of his work has moved to the clinic. Um, the latest kind of um, take on all of this is he's very keen on a particular mechanism of accumulation of DNA damage, which may very well be substantially influenced by sirtuins, so, you know, it's not surprising that he talks about it a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm all for that. Wow, that's fantastic. And I think the last type, we were talked about all six, and the last type of damage, uh, or, you know, around aging is really around intracellular protein links. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of summarize as this last piece to um, the kinds of damage that we're, we're, we experience as we get older? Yeah, sure. So, um, the body is held together, not just by our bones, bones, our skeleton, but also by a kind of lattice of proteins called the extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix is really important, especially for certain tissues, because it is what gives those tissues their elasticity. So what tissues need to be elastic? Well, a great example um, that we all know about cosmetically is the skin. You know, the reason we get wrinkles is because the skin becomes less elastic. But if we're talking about life-threatening issues, then the most important one is the major arteries, which have to be elastic in order to effectively buffer the heartbeat, pulsating changes of blood pressure. As the arteries get stiffer, we, the, the heart has to pump harder. And that's a large part of why we get hypertension, why we get high blood pressure in the elderly, which of course has all manner of pathological knock-on effects. Um, so, yes, it would be extremely valuable if we could restore the elasticity of our blood vessels and indeed our skin. Um, and it turns out that the chemistry that underlies the loss of elasticity is, well, I wouldn't say it's completely understood, but it's been very well understood for quite a long time. 
And it's caused by chemical reactions that occur between the proteins in the extracellular matrix and sugar that is circulating in our bloodstream. Uh, those chemical reactions, just like every other type of damage that only accumulates so slowly that evolution doesn't care, um, it, uh, it's, these are slow reactions, rare reactions, but occasionally they result in new chemical bonds forming randomly between proteins of the extracellular matrix. And the randomness is the problem. The extracellular matrix proteins are already cross-linked together on purpose, but they're cross-linked in a very regular way. And it's that regularity, that lattice, that causes the elasticity to be there in the first place. So, yeah, so we'd like to get rid of these additional cross-links. And it turns out that their chemical structure is completely different from the ones that are there on purpose, or indeed from anything else that the body creates on purpose, which is great. It means that in principle, we should be able to identify drugs that attack those bonds, those chemical links, and don't attack anything else. Turns out it's not that easy. Uh, the, the, those new cross-links are very stable, very hard to break, but we're getting there now. A lot of people just gave up on this completely. In fact, most people did. And we had to kind of revive this single-handedly. We um, published, we, 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 we funded a group at Yale University for many years um, to grind away at this problem. And they cracked it. They figured out enough about this structure, these, these, these structures, and they were able to do a lot of experimentation. And eventually they found enzymes again that were able to break them. And that is now far enough along that um, it's been spun out again into a startup company, which is being funded by a lot of our friends, um, you know, people who also fund Sense Research Foundation itself. So yeah, it's going pretty well. Um, it's still a bit of an orphan when it comes to this. You know, that's, a, that's the only company that's working in this space, largely because a lot of people just forgot that this should be included as one of the problems in the first place. But that is, we're fixing that. So this is really interesting, because as you know, a lot of uh, people that we speak to that are part of our target audience are in the, you know, the life sciences space, the pharmaceutical companies. So one of the things that I see also with SENS is that there's a lot of research that you're doing to help try to shape and look at all of these seven biological systems or routes, if you will, to, uh, to cell damage and how we can actually slow that down. So basically slow the erosion down. You know everything from you know uh, engineering new mitochondria to removing toxic uh, oxysterols to everything from ne uh, neocortex neuron replacement. So what do you see in the future? Do you see these new chemical entities? Do you see pharmaceutical companies kind of taking on these really robust, new, innovative, kind of avant-garde, almost kind of controversial areas? Uh, in the future, what what is your sense around the new uh, the new frontier? Yeah, totally. It's unstoppable now. I mean, uh, you know, it didn't take us to get the pharmaceutical industry interested in being more than just the pharmaceutical industry. In other words, in moving into cell therapies and gene therapies and so on. That was already happening before we came along. But in relation to aging, it's going to be fundamental. There will be a role for pharmaceuticals in the uh, rejuvenation portfolio. But the major role will be taken by regenerative medicine, cell therapies, gene therapies, and therefore the medical industry has to recognize that. And it is recognizing that. And it's welcoming it, to be honest. It's with open arms. Um, but of course, it's early days right now, which means that most of the action is not happening in big companies. It's happening in startups. And our, you know, we are a nonprofit, Sense Research Foundation, because when we started, we had to be. There was no industry. You know, nobody really believed this could be done. Um, and so, you know, the only way we could possibly fund it at all was, pure, was purely by philanthropy. People who actually wanted to make money were not interested. But over the past few years, that's completely changed. We've made enough progress, not just we at Sense, but also other groups around the world, that at least a few of the more courageous investors who do want to make money, but they understand that early stage investment makes sense. They'd like to, they're happy taking a lot of shots on goal and you know, um, having just the occasional jackpot, a, a few of those people started to get interested. And that has meant that by now, at sense, even though we are a non-profit, a public charity, a 501c3, uh, nevertheless, our business model is to spin projects out. We work on projects for as long as it takes to get them to a point of sufficient proof of concept 
that investors get excited. And then we create a company, we transfer the IP, you know, we take a nominal stake, uh, just um, so we don't want to dilute other investors. And, you know, of course, the project then gets rather better funded because investors tend to write bigger checks than donors do. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, we've done that half a dozen times now. And um, we also work very closely. I spend a lot of my time helping other companies that have arisen independently of Sensor Research Foundation, but doing very closely aligned work. I help them to get money as well. So, um, yeah, it's all really growing exponentially now. And, um, you know, it, it's for sure going to be, you know, less than, you know, in the next two or three years, we're going to see more and more cases of big companies getting involved. We're already seeing examples, like there was one just last week, of acquisitions happening, of actual rejuvenation startups that came out of the, work, the kind of work that we do that are being acquired for proper money by big companies. And that's going to grow and grow. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very exciting area. I mean, I mean, you hear all kinds of things, like Peter Diamandis has his own genetic company and everybody is, there's CRISPR and there's all sorts of new types of technologies that are out there that I think is now open the door. And I think really in some ways, COVID-19 has been a, a bit, uh, been a bit of an accelerant, if you will, on all of these frontiers. It's sort of, it's kind of democratizing and opening the doors to all sorts of opportunities. And I'm sure that's something that you're probably gonna be seeing. But one of the things that's interesting around investments on rejuvenation types of companies and technologies is people wanting to understand what the target audience is and what that universe is gonna look like in terms of the, the buying power. Now, one of the things I guess that becomes a bit of, is really asking the question about the barriers because fundamentally, this is a bit of a, a mind game. It's getting people to accept that aging doesn't have to be inevitable. There's a huge almost learning curve or a gap that the general public needs to overcome to almost appreciate the possibility that they could live to 150 to 200. But here's the question is, if that is the case and everybody can technically live forever, why isn't the general public running to this? What is, what is some of the barriers uh, psychologically for people on this concept? Yeah, it really comes back to what I was saying at the beginning of our chat. Um, they're just, they're just terrified of getting their hopes up. They're so terrified of aging that the only way they can cope is by tricking themselves into believing that they're not terrified at all and that aging is some kind of blessing in disguise. You know, it's complete bullshit. There's no question about that. But it works. You know, if it allows you to put things out of your mind and get on with your life, then it's better than being preoccupied by this terrible thing that's going to happen to you or that you think is probably going to happen to you. And of course, that is entirely dependent on one's innate sense of how likely it is that something really is going to come along. So as time goes on, we get this very, very step by step, small steps, incremental changes in where we actually are in the science. And that translates into incremental changes in the level of optimism that is expressed publicly by experts in the science, like myself or like David Sinclair, right? And eventually we reach a tipping point. We reach a point where the center of gravity of what expert opinion, expert people, experts are willing to say on camera and on stage moves to us at a level where people think, you know, maybe this really is gonna happen in time for me, right? At that point, game over. There will be, you know, it'll be very turbulent for a short while. And I keep warning people about this. I keep saying, especially to people in the financial services sector, you know, your, the people who buy your products are going to want different products. Like at what, overnight, what they want is going to change. Because overnight, people's sense of how long they expect to live is going to go up by a large, by a large factor. Uh, because they're just going to start, they, they're going to, suddenly allow themselves to think rationally about this and to believe what that crazy guy with the British accent and the beard was saying for the past 15 years. Right? <laughs> that, uh, I do, it, yeah. So further on that though, I mean, there's gotta be some other pieces to this. And so when we start talking about the ethics and the other concerns that are sort of the white elephant in the room, one you know, can actually describe the fact that there are some people who probably don't have a, who don't understand the difference between aging and aging in a healthy way. 
I think that there also is a bit of a psychological concern that they're going to be older and sick. And so I think that there's also some general education that needs to be fostered in people understanding about really, I guess, in some ways, as, as David Sinclair has framed it as lifespan, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or and just framing it in a different way that yeah. you have a longer period of time of wellness, which I think is really people's mind, uh, you know, the, the, when you picture aging, what that looks like. And I think that's why a lot of people might be terrified of the idea of living to 150. Yeah. I think the other issue comes down to is people may be bored. Some people yeah. may say, well, what am I possibly going to do when I'm 200 years old? I'll have done it all. So what do you say to people who have the, those kinds of concerns? So let's start with the question about being old for a long time. In other words, being you know, physically or mentally diminished for a long time. I mean, like, my take is like it's been 15 years now that I've been telling people this. They ought to have got it by now. And if they haven't got it, it's kind of more their fault than mine. That like being sick is risky. If you are sick, you are. If you stay sick, you're going to have a high risk of dying sometime soon. Conversely, if you are staying healthy, you're going to have a low risk of dying sometime soon. So longevity is a side effect. This is all about health and nothing else. This is what we're doing at Sands and elsewhere is medical research. And medical research is not something that people have ethical issues about. It's just like people don't like being sick. People don't like other people being sick. That's it. End of story. So if we come to something like boredom, well, one of my friends, Brian Kennedy, another expert in this area, I was on stage with him um, uh, some, a couple of years ago, and he put it as pithily as I've ever done. He said, look, if I've got a choice at some point between being bored at 150 or having Alzheimer's at 80, I think I know which one I'm going to choose. <laughs> um, you know, and there are not many other people who would choose differently. So the fact is, it's the, the question only arises out of desperation, not think about the question rationally. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's actually fantastic. I mean, maybe one of the other things that might be coming up here as well is is you know the concern around costing so um you know here here we are we're going to be in the state where suddenly we're going to have this bolus of people that are going to be living you know technically forever is there concerns financially that governments may not want to seize this concept who may be poo-pooing the idea of you know um, being able to defer aging because of the concerns of who's going to pay for this how do we sustain life are these things that you are often approached about as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, well, okay, first of all, let's be clear. Governments are not the problem. And the reason they're not the problem is because they only care about one thing, which is getting re-elected. So they are going to follow public opinion. It's public opinion, therefore, that's the actual problem. We have to get people out of this psychological rut of desperate fear of getting their hopes up and so on. And once we do, we're done. The question then comes, you know, how will it work in practice? When people actually want this, are they going to get it? At the moment, of course, we see that, um, you know, medicine is limited by ability to pay. Uh, medicine for the elderly, at least, you know, you know not, not a lot of people can get the most up-to-date high-tech medicine. And that's not even a, a consequence of the fact that you guys in the US have this crazy private healthcare system. It, uh, it's true elsewhere, too. So... How is this going to be different? Well, the fundamental difference is very clear. The medicine that we have today for the elderly fundamentally doesn't work. All it does is it keeps people alive in a sick state of health for a little bit longer, because it can't be a lot longer, as I mentioned earlier, being sick is risky, but a little bit longer, and that costs a lot of money for nothing except a little bit of, un of poor quality life, right? Even then, we still think it's worth having, uh, apparently, but that's all it is. And so there aren't really votes in extending that to everybody uh, at high cost. But consider now the situation where the medicine actually does work. Okay, then, first of all, it's preventative. And prevention is always better and cheaper than cure, right? So we're going to save money directly just by spending less on keeping sick people alive. But also, far bigger are the indirect costs. The fact that the kids of the elderly are no longer going to be unproductive by virtue of having to look after their sick parents. And of course, biggest of all is the fact that the elderly themselves are going to be able-bodied and able to continue to actually um, contribute wealth to society. So 
you know, I know it's very, very, you know, uh, weird to uh, an American audience, especially since, you know, the US population generally doesn't like taxation. But the fact is, it would be economically, you don't even have to think about the electoral imperative or the humanitarian imperative. The sheer mercenary economic imperative is that it would be economically suicidal for any nation not to make sure that these therapies are available irrespective of ability to pay uh, to whoever's old, to everyone who's old enough to need them. And, um, you know, everyone's going to understand this very soon. There is, of course, a precedent that we can use perfectly well, even in the US. It's just it's not in medicine. The precedent is basic education, which, I mean, yes, it's too basic, but it exists and it's free to everyone. And the fundamental reason it's free is the same reason, that if you don't educate your kids, then 20 years down the road, the country's going to not have a workforce, it's going to be bankrupt. Yeah, I want to, in the last few minutes that we have at the top of the hour, we do have a question from somebody asking about in the biomedical industry, really asking about the holistic approach and very interested in some of the therapies that are, are being worked on right now with, with the SENS, uh, SENS group. He just wants to find out if there's examples of how you're combining therapies, either with ones that are already available or together. What does this look like? How expensive is this and who's paying for it? Right, so the combination part is in the future. That's the last step of all of this. What has to be done before that is develop the, to develop the individual component, to the repair of this type of damage, the repair of that type of damage, and to get them working. And that can be done uh, you know, in isolation because there are always going to be patient groups that have one particular type of damage accumulating at a more rapid rate than the others. In particular, there's going to be small but significant patient groups where one type of damage is accumulating massively faster than the others because of some congenital defect. And so the typical route to market for any of this is to start by focusing on the, that relatively small population uh, because there's plenty of money that can be made even from a small population if your drug really works and nothing else does, right? And getting them to benefit and then moving out from there into people who are um, you know, just relatively older and the last step is combining all of these things for the general population who are getting all of the seven types of damage at roughly the same speed and they're bad for them at roughly the same age. But that is not something that's going to be commercialized yet. Yeah. So I think this is actually a probably a whole other conversation and you bring up something that uh, really gives food for thought, which is, should this be a right? Is this actually something that all citizens should be granted as almost like a utility, like education, like health. And right now in amidst the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the social upheaval, the economic uh, overturn, there's a lot of all of these things are kind of getting turned on its head right now is what should be a right versus what's a privilege, who's getting it versus not, who is the haves versus the have nots. That's a whole other discussion as it relates to who's going to live forever versus who's not. So very say, interesting let, topic. Let, let me say a word about that. Um, so, I mean, I think the pandemic teaches us something that perhaps our elected representatives didn't really appreciate until now, which is that there are actually votes in altruism. What we're seeing in the US and through, across the world is that we've got a disease which is overwhelmingly a disease of the elderly. The younger generation are very, very rarely severely affected. And yet, the younger generation are submitting to really, really unbelievably onerous limitations on their lives, you know, even though, they're not, even though they themselves are not affected. So it's not really such, it's not really such an every man for himself kind of world as politicians may be inclined to presume that it is. And the more that we can leverage that realization in the corridors of power, the more we will get politicians to see that putting some investment into the rejuvenation of the elderly, not just the rejuvenation of their immune system, but rejuvenation overall, is something that will actually, you know, there will be votes in it. Are we, are the 40, 50, 60 year olds, are we gonna see this opportunity to live till 100 or are we really seeing this for basically the people who are just born, being born today. When, when can we feasibly expect to extend our lives beyond 100? Yeah, that is, of course, the $64 billion question, that's for sure. Uh, and of course, we don't know. 
any pioneering technology, it's all speculation how soon it's really going to come to fruition. But I think we've got a 50-50 chance of getting there within the next 16 or 17 years from now. And, you know, yes, there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for the next 100 years. Who gives a damn? The fact is, a 50% chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. So that means, yes, that people in their 40s or 50s now would have an opportunity to benefit. That's awesome. We're at the top of the hour, and I think, in to respect everybody's time, we're probably going to close it up now. This has been a fascinating topic, and literally something that can fill books, you know, webinars for hours and hours with all the the research, the the insights, the controversies. Um, these are the kinds of things that Impetus ultimately likes to leverage and to use in the Impetus Insight platform with our asynchronous and our synchronous virtual collaboration tools. We can allow people to have these big, hairy, audacious conversations with your internal and external stakeholders, having discussions that are beyond the pill, talking about longevity, talking about eroding the aging process, and what pharma and life science companies can actually do and work collectively to be able to aim towards that goal. So that is really ultimately the purpose behind this. So thank you for everybody's attention today. Aubrey, it has been an absolute pleasure. Love the work that you're doing. Um, and can't wait to see more of the successes coming your way. So thank you for everybody's time and wishing you all a wonderful day. And thanks for having me on the show.